delicious. All right. Thank you, wife. Appreciate you. All right. Appreciate that. Amen. Do me a favor. Let's go ahead and turn our Bibles now to the book of Luke, chapter number 17. Luke, chapter number 17. I do want to give you some Bible before you go home this evening. Uh, again, it's a blessing to have an opportunity to share with you mission trips and opportunities that the Lord opens for my wife and I because you want, you definitely want to have the mindset of supporting missions and you want to have the mindset of supporting Christians that are abroad who don't have the resources and the funds that you don't that you have, but to be able to be used of God to you send some of that elsewhere and then to see Christians with what they got and they're thankful and they have a heart of gratitude with things that m a lot of the time in America we don't. Uh, it really is humbling. And that, that picture I'll share with you next time, just underneath the canopy, uh, all those ladies were walking from their pueblo, from the, in the pueblo of their houses just to come to Bible study on a Tuesday night. And I'm telling you guys, no AC, they have flies everywhere, but they had the Bibles open. And sometimes it's difficult for us to come to church faithfully, regularly, with AC and heating inside of a building. Some of y'all complain, some of y'all murmur, murmur, murmur. And you know what? When you go on a mission trip, it just humbles your heart to say, man, God, I'm ready to keep serving. Tonight, I just want to leave you with a small message called, Servants Obey the Master's Command. That's the title of tonight's message. Servants Obey the Master's Command. Do me a favor, start with me now, verse number one, Luke 17. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto the sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, By and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meat, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink? Did he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Once again, I invite you to please fellowship with us this evening. Lord Jesus, you are welcome to walk in our midst and to correct us and to feed us and to nurture us and to nourish us with your word and strengthen us in the spirit of God and, and convict us. Speak to us because we're here for you. None other reason. If anybody here came not for you, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would talk to them even now as we continue through the preaching so that, God, they would be convicted to re-examine and re-evaluate their attitude this afternoon in their heart that we should come here for you, Lord, as servants, obeying your command, God, to assemble with the saints underneath the preaching of your word. Would you please now fill us with your spirit and have your way this evening in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Look here now, church, in verse number one. Let's go back now as we go through the scriptures. Jesus said that offenses will come. It is impossible that offenses will come. They're going to come. They will come through people, not necessarily through supernatural elements of forces. For example, a tornado or a hurricane or some type of rain, etc. A flat tire, you know, your car breaking down, that's not an offense. Offenses come through people. Jesus said that it's impossible, but that they will come. If your Savior forewarned you about offenses... You and I need to do our best then to examine ourselves that we are not the one through whom they come. Uh, but rather that we will be the one to avoid that. You see here, offense is a displeasure. It's an anger or a moderate anger. It's a scandal. 
An offense is a cause of stumbling. Any transgression of law, divine or human, a crime, it could be a sin. It could be an act of wickedness or the omission of a duty that you had to do. Uh, Number two, an offense could be defined as a cause of stumbling. Any transgression, any of those things. Let's go quickly to Romans chapter 14. This is not our main message. This is free. And I just want to give this to you quickly on this topic. In the context, we know that Jesus is talking about little ones that believe in him, that it's better for someone to hang a a big old heavy rock on their neck to be drowned in the sea than to hinder a little child from believing in him. We know that. But let's take that a step further. We believe in him tonight. None of us are discouraging one another from believing in him tonight, but you and I are at fault from causing an offense in our practice and our belief of him and then in our love for one another. You and I do that. It's unfortunate, but it's a reality. Look at what the scripture says, starting quickly in Romans 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. There's nothing wrong with discussing and trying to assist weaker Christians, because that's the reality. Tonight in your church, there are some of you that are stronger than others, and that's okay. That's the reality. But when we are coming along your side as the brother or sister weak, We are going to receive you up until the point when you begin to use your weakness as an excuse to continue to dispute with things that you don't want to do. Uh, Look at verse number two. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another, who is weak, eateth herbs. You're going to have differences of food diets, for example. The Lord is going to discuss here. That was a big deal then. And unfortunately, it's a big deal in in a lot of circles of believers. I don't know why, but it, it could cause a big deal. Uh, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. I want you to focus on that this evening. If God received the sinner because they put their faith and trust in his son that he died for their sins and rose again and offered them eternal life, then everything else after the fact, outside of that salvation message, when we begin to judge one another concerning our spiritual walk with God, that's, an, that's a stumbling, and that could be a cause of an offense. God says there are weak brethren, and in the, in the pertaining to the foods, one eateth herbs, other eat all things, and when we begin to cause problems in that particular context, we are going to have to answer to God about that. I want you to focus on that this evening. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for who is able to make him to stand, church? God. God is able to make him to stand. Further down, look at verse number 8. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Let's continue on here to verse number 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us therefore, I'm sorry, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. That's what we should judge. We shouldn't judge anyone on their liberties concerning diet, but we should judge one another on what could potentially be a hindrance because of your liberty that could stumble them from following the Lord, from being obedient to the commands of the master. That's what we should judge. Notice what he's saying there. I know and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus. So now here he is. He's appealing to the highest power in the entire universe, the Lord himself, that there is nothing unclean of itself. All things are edible. You can eat whatever you want. It's not a big deal. But to him, now notice that's the brother, that's the sister, that esteemeth anything to be unclean, it's to that individual you see to him it is unclean it's not to the lord it's not to god it's not a spiritual matter if you will concerning diets but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat you see that's the problem now walkest thou not charitably destroy not him with thy meat for whom christ died you see it has to do with the salvation of their soul your food and your diets and all the other liberties that you have if your brother is grieved by that then you're You're being an offense to your brother, and we don't want to do that. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, 
but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's spiritual matters, not physical. And here's what your Bible says. He that in these things serveth the church. Is that what it says? The brethren. Is that what it says? It says Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. That is the way that we can judge one another. If I am conducting myself in a manner that is in accord with Christ's commands, I can be approved of you and you can be approved of me in our conduct or in our liberty or whatever we're trying to do in a fellowship. If it's outside of Scripture and if it's a liberty and I try to bring it and uh, uh, back to Scripture and I try to make it spiritual, then I'm causing an offense because it's not. I can't back it up. That's just, Brother Carlos, the spirit of what I esteem to be unclean and vice versa you if you try to do the same for me. But if we are in these parameters, God says, that's acceptable to me, son. That's acceptable to me, daughter. And that will be accepted by the church. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Rather than trying to use your liberty as an excuse for why you shouldn't help esteem the brother next to you who's weak or sister who's next to you that's weak, who doesn't know enough like you or may not have enough knowledge like you, your God just commanded you to do your best to edify that brother. For me, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure. He, says, he tells you two times. But it is evil for that man, now notice, who eateth with offense. Because that's an intent now. That's you doing it on purpose. And God knows that, and that's a sin. We should not be doing that. So these are, again, these are just side nuggets. When Christians assume the position of Christ to judge one another's spirituality by the food they eat. But in application, anything outside of the scripture, by that judgment that you call you know, from the Lord, and it offends a Christian from obeying the word of God, you will give an account before God. Rules or guidelines that we promote here at church will be spiritually and scripturally based. For example, how we promote modest clothing, or we promote for you to listen to godly entertainment at your home and everything else. But aside from that, our Christian conduct one toward another, we need to be careful, believer, because Aside from my acts or your acts that can potentially become a stumbling block for one another, we need to be mindful that we're going to have to stand before God to give an account. And not only that, but there's one more thing that could become an offense to you in this process and in this progress for you to become stronger than where you were. Because remember, go back to verse number one, the weaker brother. And then in chapter 15, this is free, uh, there are strong Christians and then there are weak Christians. So what should be our goal? Our goal is to get you, Brother Week and Sister Week, to, to help you to become stronger. But uh, allow me to warn you now, the second offense that might come is not going to be necessarily from a Christian trying to help you by them calling you out in love of, hey, brother, you should watch your mouth, or hey, brother, you know, consider this sister with your dress. It, it's going to come from the Bible. You say, show me, brother. I will. Quickly, quickly, Mark chapter number 4, and then we'll go back to our base text. Mark chapter number 4. If you can get a hold of this tonight, church, you're going to be a lot Stronger, I guarantee you. Mark 4, verse number 16. We're talking about now when a Christian can become offended, not by the conduct of a fellow Christian, not by the accountability by a fellow Christian, but simply by what the Word of God demands of them. Look at verse 16. These, This is Jesus speaking concerning the parable of the soil. You guys heard that, the heart and all that. These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the Word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises. Now listen, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Do you see there? So that's my second warning to you tonight. For the word's sake. So when we go back to Luke 17, we're going to talk about some of that in application, but Offending one of these little ones is the context of, of, of Luke 17. But notice how you can become offended. Not by the conduct of the brother sitting next to you, not by the way they're living, sister, next to you, but simply by what they're reminding you from the Bible. And then on your own Bible time, what you're learning from the Scriptures on what it's, when it's beginning to expose within your life, your, er, your errors and your faults and, and, what, and what you're lacking in and, and what God is demanding you to work on, to repent of, to do more of, if you don't get a hold of that heart, then the word is going to offend you. So be careful for the two offenses. One, you to your brother and sister. 
And then number, number two, the word of God in your heart if you don't have a love for God when it begins to call you out. Let's go to Luke chapter 17. Tonight, I want to focus on the servant, though. That was for free, Brother Felipe. That was for free. Let's go now to Luke 17, verse number 3. He says, take heed to yourselves. Remember, who is he talking to? Verse number 1, the disciples. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. What is what does it mean to take heed to something? It just simply means to mind or to regard with care, to take notice of, to attend to, to observe, like caution, you know, watch, attention. So to your own selves. So here's Jesus redirecting the attention, not necessarily to himself, but to one another, the disciples. And he's telling them, you guys need to listen up now because of something that is going to happen at some point. And that's you trespassing against one another. What is a trespass, you might ask? Here it is. It literally just means to pass beyond, primarily, to pass over the boundary. You know, the boundary line of another's land, for example. You trespass on another's property. To enter unlawfully upon the land of another. Uh, but number two, to commit any offense or to do any act that injures or annoys another. Remember Luke 17.1. To violate any role or rectitude to the injury of another or to intrude, to go too far or to put too much inconvenience by demand or importunity as to trespass upon the time or patience of another. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Any injury or offense done to another. So what is Jesus telling you? He said in verse number three, look to yourselves. You could trespass someone here tonight. And you probably have trespassed someone here tonight. But here's, what, here, here's the resolution to that. Here's what Jesus said that you can do, because I'm going to show you right now. When he comes to you or when she comes to you and says, you, you, you offended me, you trespass, whatever that might be. And if they, that is the offended party, and if you say, I'm sorry, forgive me, that same Jesus told that person to forgive you. That's it. You, you forgive them. You forgive him. Hey, brother, I'm sorry. I, I, I know I shouldn't have done this. I'm sorry for the way it came off. Hey, brother, I, I'm sorry for what this brother did in front of you guys. I know that could have stumbled you. Hey, brother, it's okay. You know what? I forgive you. Thank you. That's the command that both of us are obeying by the master's commands. We're both being servants in that regard. So notice now as we follow along, forgiving the brethren. Verse number five. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. You know what's funny? This is the only time in your Holy Bible where they ask that. Isn't that funny? They're not asking Jesus to increase their faith that he has the power to provide food. They're not asking Jesus to increase their faith to believe that he can raise the dead. In other words, they're not asking Jesus to help them to understand the supernatural. They're asking Jesus, help us to do that, forgiving one another. Isn't that wild? You know what Jesus said, though? If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, how many all know what that is? Real small, real small. Ye might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted into the sea. Now watch this, and it should obey you. You know what the Lord said there? You have enough faith. As a matter of fact, you just don't want to use the faith that you have. Here we have the Lord Jesus Christ's response. You have enough faith. You're just not wanting to use a mustard-sized seed to forgive a brother who trespassed against you. They could. They could as easily as the Lord is saying to tell that tree to uproot itself and to be cast out into the sea. That's how easy it is for them to exercise that little faith when that brother says, I'm sorry, and then you say, I forgive you. It's okay, not a big deal. Even if they come back to you seven times in the same day. Seventy times seven, the Lord says elsewhere. In other words, as soon as that happens, you forgive. You use the mustard size seed faith that Christ gave you to forgive them. Do not hang on to that. Because as you hang on to that, you're being a disobedient servant. You say, brother, can you keep show me? I can. Look at verse number seven. Here's what we're going to focus on tonight. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, 
will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink? Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. In other words, I don't think so. So likewise, ye. Ooh. So who is he talking to? The disciples. Who is he talking to? The apostles. Who is he talking to? Servants. Who's the master in this conversation? Jesus. Who are the servants? The disciples. Servants serve the commands of the master. Look at what he said there in verse number 10. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. I want to focus on this tonight, church, before we come to a close. Did anybody notice here that the servant was named? Anybody? Was the servant named at all? No. You know why? Because servants are not important. They're not important. In the narrative here, the servant is not important because it's not about the servant. It's about the master who's in charge. It's his property. It's his domain. It's his land. That servant is serving because that is his duty. That's his job. He has an obligation to perform his duties. The servant has a job. He has a duty and is working for the master under the master's authority. Servants serve their master's command. Notice we see the servant here plowing. You see that in verse number seven? That servant was working. He was feeding cattle. I want you to notice now, the servant does not make their own schedule. The servant does not make their own routine. I want you to notice here that the servant doesn't make their own break time. But they're under the master's command. The servants don't feed themselves first, but the master. Are you following me? Look at now through verse number 8 and 9. The reason some of you won't serve your master more is because you're waiting for the acknowledgement. You know, the pat on the back. Good job. I'm glad you're doing that. You know, look at what I did. Or perhaps you're waiting for someone else to start, and then you'll follow because you don't have enough individual, independent obedience to the master's command. You don't need to be asked. You just need to do. Let me repeat that now. You don't need to be asked. You just need to do. In love, church, I'm sharing this with you. I'm just reminding you all and myself included of the master's command. Now, before you argue with me, if this is for me today, I say that this is for all of us. Look at verse number 10. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. If you can operate off of that mentality, every time you come to church, you will be a happy Christian. Because your joy is not coming from the person who acknowledges you or not. Your joy is not coming from the approval of a brother or sister. Your joy is coming from the master because you're obeying the commands. You're doing what you've been commanded to do by being a blessing to somebody else, by giving of your money, by being a soul winner, by being faithful to come to church, by participating, by doing all those things. You're doing what you've been commanded to do. Almost done. Let's go to Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter 10, and then we're going to come to a close. We're going to try to wrap it up here soon. Mark number 10. Look with me now in verse number 37. Mark 10, verse number 37. This is now what I call disciple syndrome. What does that mean, disciple syndrome? It means when we can uh, get a little bit heady and high-minded, when we think ourselves more than what we really are. In one place of Scripture, the Bible says, when ye are nothing, we're nothing. But we tend to lose that because we're sensual beings. We still need approval. We, I understand we are human beings. We have emotions. It feels good when somebody says, good job, or we, we are acknowledged. But I'm telling you, if we can get those feelings under subjection back to the obedience of the Word of God, you will be happier because you're going to do because you've been told to do, and the Lord will give you his joy. That's what he promised. So here's where we're going to see a great example of what I call disciple syndrome. Look at verse 37. Two of his disciples asked him a question. Uh, they said unto him, Grant us unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. Uh, but Jesus said unto them, You know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? 
And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized withal, shall ye be baptized. They will die for him, for their Lord one day, uh, James and John. But let's keep reading. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, so now this is the disciples, everybody else, they began to be much displeased with James and John. You know, disciples getting angry at each other. You know, disciples complaining at one another. You know, disciples having a, a grudge against another, being envious. I don't think that happens in church today, right? None of y'all have problems with another Christian in our church, anybody here tonight. Now look at verse number 42. Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. So what happens is when you join the military or you join some kind of workforce where you are a delegated authority to have over others under you, you have your subordinates, that's the way of the world. And so when you can make it up in that ladder, here's what Jesus said. You know those Gentiles? You know how they operate? That's what they do. They exercise lordship. They govern over other people. They tell them what to do. They have the authority. Hence, your boss at work. Anybody here tonight? But now look at verse number 43. Notice how Jesus is going to counteract this world's system of object, I'm sorry, submission to that authority, to man, because of that pride creeping in, because of that, if you will, over amount of force being exerted upon those that are under them just because they have the authority to do so. Look at verse number 43. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Who is the example? Earlier in Romans 14, who do you serve? Jesus Christ. Uh, who are you trying to gain the approval of? Jesus Christ. So if Jesus Christ is the one who you're going to give an account to one day, if Jesus Christ is the example that you and I are, are to follow, then he is the example of the servant, obeying the commands of the Father. Look at verse number 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and listen now, and to give his life a ransom for many. I don't know if you remember, church, but when your Savior died on the cross, he was despised. I don't know if you remember, church, but when he died on that cross, a, a Roman took that spear and, and, and stuck him right there on the side. I don't know if you remember on that cross, but your Savior said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What excuse then do you have for not getting along with another Christian? What excuse then do you have for not obeying the commands of the master? If Jesus Christ came down from heaven to obey the Father's command to die for sinners and to give his life a ransom for many, who are you to tell me and who are you to tell Jesus, not the pastor, forget Brother Carlos, put me out on the side, I am nothing, I'm a dirt, I'm just a conscience with, a, with Mexican dirt, that's all I am. But who are you to tell to Jesus Christ but I should have some acknowledgement, Lord. I mean, uh, look at what I'm doing. I, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And shouldn't I get some applaud or no? You know what Jesus said? You are an unprofitable servant. You do what you're commanded to do. I know that sounds counteractive from those happy messages you listen to on YouTube. We're not talking with Joel Osteen tonight. There's no better in you at all. Amen. Uh, we're wretched men with Christ saving our soul. What am I trying to help you with, church? If you want to be happier, then you need to get out of your own self. You need to stop thinking that you're coming to church because someone is here just for you and, and you're here to just, no, no, no. You're coming here to church because you're obeying the one who came from heaven to die for your sins. You're coming to church because you are coming with the hope and the intent to be a blessing to the person sitting in back of you, the person that's sitting in front of you. You're coming to church to serve not to be served. You're coming to church to give, not to receive. You're coming to church to give of yourself, to forgive when people trespass you and do you wrong. That's what they did to him on the cross, and he forgave. And you can't forgive a brother who isn't God on the cross? We're all guilty of disciple syndrome. We murmur at one another. We complain before the master himself. And yet he humbly reminds us, you remind yourself, this is what I came to do. I came to be the minister. If you want to be great in the eyes of God, 
then what you need to first do is get on your knees and serve the brethren. Get on your knees and say, brother, how can I meet a need here? How can I serve here, brother? That's who God is going to approve of. Now, allow me now to finish with these monologues, if you will. Our hope for you is to see that in you one day. Our hope and our testimony of our mission trip is so that you can see that in us. And allow us, that is my wife and I, to provoke you in love and to disciple you, whether it's one-on-one or here at church, to motivate you. To get you to the place in your Christian walk where you'll just want to do what the Bible commands you without feeling pressured by the pastor and all the guilt trips and all that stuff you go through on your own. Because your heart will grow and your heart will mature to the point where you'll want to please the master as an obedient servant. When the master says, read your Bible, and then you respond, okay, yes, Lord, I will. When your master says, I want you to pray more, okay, master, I I will. When your master says, I want you to go to church consistently and faithfully and not stop and quit, okay, master, I will. When your master says, I don't want you to just to go to church, but I want you to serve at church, and you say, oh, okay, Lord, yes, I will. When your master says, I want you to give of your finances, okay, yes, Lord, I will. When your master says, I want you to forgive, uh, okay, Lord, yes, I will. When your master says, I want you to go tell others and soul win and preach the gospel to every creature, uh, okay, Lord, yes, I will. I'll do it for you, Jesus, because... You obeyed the Father's command. You you came down to this earth to die on the cross for my soul. Okay, Jesus, I'll do that in return because I love you. I I want to please you. You're my Lord, and you deserve what you want to do with this body that you purchase, what you want to do with this money that you provide. It's all yours, Lord. You see, friend, this is what I'm hoping, and this is what I'm praying where you will get to the point of in your own individual Christian walk when you'll just want to obey the master's command for love because of love motivated by love for what he did for you he gave his life for you so what if if he just tells you to go the extra mile and forgive that person what if if he just tells you to go the extra mile and hey you know you've been considering giving this much and and you know you're not it's not really much because you know you got everything else under the sun here he gave that all to you anyways Uh, Why don't you just be obedient and just give and just be faithful? Just come to church and just be faithful. Just do all those things that he's commanded you to do, friend. That's that's obeying the master's command. So as we come to a close, let's go back now to our base text in Luke chapter number 17. I won't take much of your time. Luke chapter number 17. And let's come back here now to verse number three and four. Take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. Listen to what he told you. He, he knows what's best. He's the counselor. Anybody remember out there? He is the prince of peace. So he'll, if you just do it his way, you'll be all right. All right, now look at verse number six. If you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you might say unto the sick of mine tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. If you just exercise that little bit of faith to do what he tells you to do you'll do it but when you don't want to don't be surprised don't be surprised now look at verse number seven which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by when he has come from the field go and sit down to meet and will not rather send him make ready with i may sup and gird thyself and serve me till i have eaten and drunk and and afterward thou shalt eat and drink that doesn't sound so nice right no no you gird yourself servant I'm hungry. Yes, yes, Lord. What would you like, Lord? Give me that cold uh, green tea. Give me them tacos of Cecina over here and and some rice and beans. Yes, Lord, I'll do that. When I'm done, then you'll eat. Yes, Lord. Do you guys get that? You do what he commands you to do because he commands you to do it. And when you argue with him, it's not necessarily against the church or uh, if you will, uh, whatever, you know, name we give this church doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The pastor doesn't matter. No, we we are doing this because the one who came down to lay his life for you, when you got saved, the Bible says your body, it was purchased by him on that cross. This body right here, this belongs to him. Bible calls this body the temple of the Holy Ghost. Bible calls this thing right here, this is the tabernacle. This right here, this is where God dwells in right here. He dwells in my heart. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I don't think so. 
I don't think so. Why? Because he did what he was commanded to do. I'm telling you, it took me years, brethren, and I'm working on this even now. I'm Brother Moat. Remember that. I'm Brother Moat. I'm going to judge myself. It, it took me a long time to recognize I do what Jesus commanded me to do because he commanded me to do it. I, I'm not coming to church faithfully before uh, we start our services to clean and, and to take out the trash and to do all these things because I want somebody to recognize me. No, I, I do that because my Lord. I'm doing it for Jesus. I'm not being faithful to my wife and, 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 and not doing all these things, providing for her financially because I want her to say, wow, look at this man. No, I, I'm doing it to please my Lord. I, I'm doing all these things because I want to please the one who gave his life for me. And that's where I get my joy. That's where I get my happiness. And when we went down there, guys, to Mexico to go serve these brethren, that's exactly what I got from Jesus. I got joy. I got peace. It didn't matter if we drove an hour or two just to hang out with seven Christians underneath a metal canopy with flies in our face and dirt all over the place and cows walking over there and all these distractions because these ladies got some Bibles with some pages that are ripped up to learn more about Jesus. And the sister, when she was ministering to them little kids over there and a special ed uh, fellow who came by because of her love for Jesus, that pastor has a love for Jesus. And his wife out there, same thing, ministering to the other women over there, they're both doing it because they love him enough to do it. I'm telling you, friend, if you can get over yourself and if you can overcome the feeling of thinking you're going to get something back or you should get something back or, or all this, no, no, no. But you do it for the benefit of somebody else. So you do it for the obedience of your master's command. You will be happier because that's the point of Christianity. It's a, it's a sacrificial love for the person next to you without even getting a thank you. He died on the cross. And before you trusted him, you weren't thankful every single day for Christ dying for you. You lived your life amok doing whatever you were doing until you came to Christ. But he did that for you anyway. He loved you anyway. So likewise, verse number 10, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. So as we come to a close, we're getting ready for the new year. As you guys can see, guys, we're a small church. We're a small assembly. We don't have a building plan. We don't have, you know, all these things that other brethren do. And, and that's okay. That's their liberty to do. We have a Bible. We have a command to go into the world. We have a command when we come here back to our little hut and our assembly and our, our headquarters, if you will, to kind of get fueled up again and go back out there and come back in here and go back out there and come back in here and disciple you over here at the house, come back here, have fellowship with you at the house, disciple you, come back here. We, we have a command. But if we begin to go into this next year with that same attitude we had from this year, don't expect to be happier. But if you can go into this next year with that heart attitude, now I'm telling you, you're going to have freedom. You're going to be happier in the marriage because you're going to love your wife because Christ, he told you to. Uh, wife, you're going to be in subjection to your husband because Christ, he told you to. Church member, you're going to come. You're going to give your finances. You're going to solo one. You're going to participate with your pastor in doing this and that because you're commanded to. You're going to have joy because you're doing those things which please your master. And your master, which is Jesus Christ, he promised you his joy when you abide in his love. Um, let me just, I, I promise you, this is my last verse. This is my last verse. John 12, y'all already know who you are. They already know who you are. I love you. I love you. Look at John 12. Just love me for one more minute. Amen. Forgive me. Amen. Seven times. Amen. Let's just go John 12. This is my last verse. I, I just want you to be reminded now, who are those that, they, that the God the Father honors? Who are those that God the Father honors? And, and then this all, what is tied up, amen? Uh, John chapter 12, and let's come here to verse number, uh, John 12, verse number, and if I can't find it, then that's okay. We'll just call it a night. Ah, I found it. Look at here now, verse number 26, and it's my last verse. If any man serve me, let him follow me. Keep following. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. Ooh, the servant. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Mm. You want the marriage to get better? Serve. You want your church to grow? Serve. You want your church needs financially to be met and missions to support? Serve in that capacity. You want things to get better and you want God to honor you? Then get back with the mentality of being on your knees, serving. God promise, I'll take care of you. I'll honor you. You guys get what we're saying here tonight? Father, I thank you for the word of God this evening. Lord, nothing fancy. We don't have 
fog light. We don't have LED lights. We don't got a Christmas tree here, God, with little sparkles. We don't, want, we don't have much, Lord God, this evening to draw or appeal to the attention of those that come here because, Lord, we don't want any glory to come to us, God. We want all the glory to go to you. But tonight, Lord, it is my open prayer that the hearers heard the message this evening, God, that, yes, you love them so much that you gave your life for them on the cross. But you gave your life for them on the cross because you were a servant and you were obedient to the commands of the Father. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for being the example to us. And tonight, God, if there's any Christian who has a hardened heart, tonight, God, if there's any church member who has a heart where they're still doubting and they're still arguing with you of why they shouldn't and, and why they can't, God, tonight, all, all I pray is that they heard from you tonight, not me, just you, of the Master's command. And, Lord, you promised, you promised there that your Father would honor those that follow you and those that serve you because they're pleasing you. Tonight, I thank you for allowing us to be here thus far after all these years. Five years, God, we've been here. I thank you for all those that have visited. I thank you for all those that have come and gone. Lord, we haven't been perfect, but we have been obedient we have been assembling. We have been continuously doing the best we can, the wife and I and the members that are here. As we come to a close at this end of this year, Father, I know we can still do more for you, but I know that it's going to take every single person tonight to help us to do those things for you. So, Father, as we come to a close, would you please help us to get back home safely, uh, help us to meditate upon the things we learned tonight, and help us to continue to make ourselves available to serve you by serving your people, meeting one another's needs the best we can. We thank you, Father, for what you're going to do through our church for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, church, I love you. It's so good to see you guys. If anybody has any prayer, comments, questions, come on up. We'll fellowship. And until next time, amen the Lord. May the Lord bless you.